Hello, I'm a woman in my 30s residing in Los Angeles. I recently came across an article online discussing how some companies now require job applicants to disclose their MBDI personality type as part of the employment process. In some cases, these companies even specify a particular personality type and explicitly state that they won't hire anyone who doesn't align with that specific type. The MBDI, or Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, is essentially a self-administered personality assessment that individuals can take voluntarily. The creators of the MBDI, Myers and Briggs, were influenced by the work of Carl Jung, a renowned Swiss psychoanalyst. This personality assessment tool was developed based on the principles of psychological typology. The MBDI test is straightforward and easy to administer, making it widely utilized in various settings, including educational institutions, workplaces, and the military. It categorizes test takers into one of 16 psychological types, offering insights into personality traits and their potential impact on behavior. I must admit that I find this trend rather unsettling. It seems that over time, various factors, such as blood type and now personality type, have gained significance in unexpected ways. My concern about this article stems from a personal experience involving my husband. You see, my husband has always been a staunch advocate of the MBDI. Even before the test became a hiring criterion, he would judge people based on their personality types. From the very day we met, he inquired, Amelia, have you ever taken an MBDI test? MBDI? I asked, puzzled. What's that? He explained that it's a personality type test known for its reliability, distinct from broad personality typing. He mentioned that he had taken the test through the official organization and was astounded by its accuracy. He encouraged me to give it a try if I had the chance. Initially, I thought he was merely making small talk to ease the initial awkwardness of our first meeting. However, not long after we started dating, he pushed his laptop in my direction, saying, here's a website where you can take the MBDI test. Go ahead and try it. It's more accurate than any psychic. At first, I believed he was joking but the earnestness in his eyes soon made me realize he was serious. So, on a sunny spring afternoon, only a week into our relationship, I found myself taking the MBDI test while my new boyfriend observed. Like anyone else, I felt a bit self-conscious about revealing my true personality when under his watchful gaze, which made me inexplicably nervous. Thus, I cautiously completed the test, and the result revealed that I was an ESTJ. Among the various personality types, I turned out to be an ESTJ, which falls under the strong manager category. This personality type tends to assess the environment and rely on clear, factual information for decision making. To my surprise, my result was the same as my husband's, who was also an ESTJ. We were both thrilled by this revelation. Some say that people in love tend to resemble each other and it seemed like we shared the same personality traits. I must admit I had worried that I might turn out to be an INFP, which is quite different from my personality type. INFPs are often seen as calm, creative, and romantic, with a deep inner conviction. While these qualities are admirable, they might not have matched well with my personality. Nonetheless, my husband and I were elated to discover our shared personality type. It was a day filled with excitement as he couldn't stop talking about the personality test. Little did we know what the future held in store for us. My husband was a practical and down-to-earth person who would prefer to spend money on hot dogs for both of us rather than on expensive Valentine's Day chocolates. He often said things like, let's think about this realistically, or did you check if it's reasonable? It seemed like he sought my validation whenever he made such statements. He believed that since we shared the same personality type, would naturally agree with him. As a result, he frequently brought up our personality type, as if he had found his long-lost twin, and he appeared genuinely delighted by it. However, I was starting to grow weary of hearing about our personality type at every turn. Honestly, 
I often put my own preferences aside and followed my husband's choices. My main objective was to maintain harmony in our relationship and avoid unnecessary conflicts over minor matters. Furthermore, my taste in food wasn't very particular, and I believed that having a pleasant and harmonious time together was more important than insisting on my own preferences. So, whenever my husband and I went out, I simply went along with his choices for dining and entertainment, including movies. Over the course of our five-year relationship, I had grown accustomed to my husband's decision-making style. My accommodating nature and his resolute decision-making actually made us a quite compatible couple. When the time came for us to marry, there were no doubts from anyone about our union, it was just a matter of timing. In fact, my friends often praised my husband for his strong sense of responsibility and professional competence, telling me that he would make an excellent husband. They advised me to hold on to him and not let him slip away. I wholeheartedly agreed with them. While I may not have known much about love, I believed that the most important qualities in a life partner were competence and sincerity, especially considering the commitment of a lifelong partnership. My husband's rational and unemotional approach to decision-making gave me a sense of security. My parents were also delighted with his personality. During his first meeting with my parents, my father approved of our marriage within five minutes of meeting him. He was impressed by my husband's confidence and dependability, which was significant given my father's extensive experience in dealing with various people through his own company. Both my mother and I trusted my father's judgment. With the blessings of both families, we earnestly began preparations for our wedding. We scouted wedding venues and made arrangements, thanks to my husband's efficient decision-making. This allowed us to manage everything within a reasonable budget. The only remaining task was to find our new home and select wedding gifts. Finding affordable housing proved to be quite challenging as the real estate market had seen substantial price increases, making it difficult to stay within our budget. Since my husband's parents were not wealthy, their financial contribution was limited. Eventually, I had to turn to my parents for assistance, and my father graciously offered to help us financially in purchasing our first home as newlyweds. I wanted to discuss this with my husband, but he suggested, why don't we split the cost of our newlywed house 50 to 50? Let's avoid buying new furniture and use what we already have. We can focus on getting the necessary electronics and furniture. Wouldn't that be a more practical approach, Amelia? Hearing his proposal left me with mixed feelings. However, I chose not to mention that my father had offered financial assistance for our newlywed house. During our previous meetings, his parents had mentioned that they would purchase the newlywed house, so we had covered most of the expenses for the wedding venue, including dresses, flowers, photography, and catering. Now, my husband was suggesting that I contribute equally to the cost of the house, leaving me feeling like I was being treated unfairly. Despite my frustration, I didn't express my discontent, as I didn't want to create any tension regarding our shared future home. Nonetheless, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. When I confided in my mother about the situation, she reassured me that these kinds of issues were common, especially when facing financial challenges, and suggested that we contribute more if necessary. However, what truly bothered me was a different aspect of the situation. While it was feasible for us to contribute more, my husband never seemed to express any remorse or gratitude towards me, even when I was making extra efforts and sacrifices. It appeared that he was more interested in ensuring that the arrangement suited him, rather than being considerate of my perspective. Over time, these incidents began to overshadow what I had once perceived as his strengths and instead revealed certain weaknesses in his character. Nevertheless, after managing numerous details, we had a successful wedding and embarked on our newlywed life. As per my husband's preference, both families contributed equally to the 1,500-square-foot house, and I purchased appliances such as a refrigerator, washer and dryer, TV, and sofa. The rest, including beds and dishes, were furnished with used items. Despite these efforts, the house felt more like a freshly cleaned space than a true newlyweds home. During the housewarming party, 
My friend playfully teased our choice of furniture, suggesting that it looked like it came from a thrift store. Those words cut deep, leaving me feeling hurt and embarrassed. However, my husband remained content with our decision, believing it was wiser to be modest and practical instead of flaunting extravagant spending. Unfortunately, his contentment was his alone, it did not resonate with me. I carried the weight of this embarrassment. Regardless of the size or nature of the problem we faced, my husband always took the lead in addressing it. He gradually became the decision maker in our household, whether it was setting up our computer's desktop, choosing a web portal, or planning for our family's financial future. My input seemed to hold no significance in any aspect of our lives, even when discussing the idea of starting a family. When I brought up the topic of having a child, my husband took control of the conversation. He acknowledged our shared desire to have a child but pointed out the significant financial implications it would entail. He emphasized that, at my current age, I could focus on my career, and having a child would disrupt that trajectory. His argument was that, by the time we were in our mid-30s, we would be in a better financial position to comfortably support a family. My concerns about the potential risks associated with older motherhood fell on deaf ears. He countered with the idea that, at any age, childcare would be challenging. His proposed plan was for us to work diligently, achieve financial stability, and then have a child when we were in our mid-30s, with the assumption that I could step away from work without undue hardship. When I continued to advocate for having a child sooner rather than later, my husband's tone shifted. He expressed confusion and frustration, raising his voice. He questioned my emotional approach to the matter and likened our decision to selecting a doll from a toy store, insisting that this required a more rational perspective. My husband's reaction surprised me, as he had never lost his temper, regardless of the situation's magnitude. I found myself taken aback by this sudden change in his demeanor. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to take the personality type test that was linked on the main portal. I wanted to understand why my husband's personality often clashed with mine. As I completed the test, I was shocked to discover that my true personality type was INFP, which was exactly the personality type my husband despised. It became clear to me why his behavior had been so irritating, it was because our personalities were fundamentally incompatible. My husband was a practical, rational, and direct manager type who thrived on order and strictness. In contrast, I was an idealistic, passionate mediator who valued harmony and avoided conflict. Our personalities were polar opposites, and while I hadn't placed much faith in MBDI, the test results seemed eerily accurate. However, I knew that if my husband ever found out, he would be horrified. In the following days, my husband and I addressed the issue by postponing our plans for pregnancy. We opened a savings account to ease the financial burden of having a child and, after three years of marriage, both our families began to express concern over our childless status. Each time, my husband employed the same tactics he used on me with his parents to delay parenthood, and it seemed to work. However, my parents had a different stance. They offered to help financially with child rearing and encouraged us to have a baby without worrying about money. This unexpected shift in my husband's unwavering stance made me question whether he had been seeking financial support from my parents all along. My suspicions regarding my husband continued to grow as I thought about the situation. I believe that revealing my parents' financial offer for our newlywed home might have altered things. One evening, we all gathered at a steak restaurant to celebrate my father-in-law's birthday. My husband, however, insisted on stopping somewhere near the restaurant first and left me there. As the meal was served, my husband still hadn't returned with the envelope of money meant for his father's gift. His siblings had already presented their gifts, leaving me waiting for him to come back. When he finally entered the restaurant, he wore a jubilant expression and held a small box in his hands. With excitement, my husband announced his grand gesture. He had purchased a brand new car and was giving it as a birthday gift to his father. Inside the box were car keys with the Mercedes-Benz emblem. 
The sight of it caused my father-in-law to drop his fork, jump from his chair, and dash outside with my husband and his sister. I sat there in a daze, bewildered by the turn of events. My sister-in-law leaned over and said, Amelia, didn't you know? Oh my god, didn't you know? Not long ago, your husband brought a brochure of imported cars to our house, and I asked him what it was for. He inquired about which imported car would make a suitable birthday gift for our father, given his financial situation. I dismissed it, laughing it off. But, oh my god. You're really something. If it were my husband, I wouldn't tolerate it. He just bought a house, how could he afford a Mercedes-Benz? She was right, we had purchased the house with the money my parents had given us. I couldn't comprehend how he could afford such a luxury car. That evening, all my in-laws were ecstatic about my husband's gift of a Mercedes-Benz, but I couldn't share their enthusiasm. I found it difficult to eat. When we returned home later that night, I confronted my husband about where he had obtained the money for the Mercedes-Benz. His response was, Honey, my dad will need a car in a few years when he gets his driver's license. Who will drive it then? Would my mom drive it without a license, or would my brother, whose license is suspended due to a DUI? It would have to be me, right? We'll make him happy with the gift, and we'll get it back in a few years. Besides, we need to change our car soon anyway. It's a logical decision, don't you think? You give a gift, and you get it back. I learned that my husband had taken out a long-term loan to afford the Mercedes-Benz, and he argued that the monthly payments weren't too burdensome. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Given our budget, how could he possibly afford a luxury car like a Mercedes-Benz? Did he think that the initial purchase price was the only cost involved? I reminded him of the exorbitant maintenance expenses associated with imported cars. If even one part malfunctioned, it could easily cost several thousand dollars to repair. Did he expect his father to cover those costs? Could he manage it with his current salary? I pointed out that he had even suggested delaying having a baby due to financial concerns. But now he seemed to have enough money set aside for a luxury car. My husband defended his decision, insisting that it was a rational choice. He also claimed that he never told me not to have a baby due to financial reasons, merely that it wasn't the right time according to common sense. He accused me of wanting to boast about my father's financial support but warned me not to make a fool of him. With that, he stormed off into his study. I was filled with frustration, feeling like I was talking to a brick wall. If only he hadn't said anything, I might not have felt so resentful. However, I couldn't help but look forward to what he would choose as a birthday gift for my father. A few months later, it was my father's birthday, and he declined a birthday party, deeming it an inconvenience for others. Instead, we had a modest gathering at home. I had originally made a reservation at a restaurant owned by a renowned chef, but my father accidentally injured his leg and couldn't leave the house. My sister's husband couldn't attend either because he needed an urgent operation. He sent my dad his favorite wine and cruise tickets as a birthday gift, making the day memorable. I had prepared a gift envelope with money for my father, along with my husband. However, my husband, who had earlier boasted about bringing a significant gift, arrived late without notice. He seemed out of breath from rushing. Despite his tardiness, he went on to brag excessively and presented his gift to my father. To my surprise, it contained two inexpensive bottles of wine, but my husband proceeded to make an extravagant speech. He claimed that the wine was from a famous winery and emphasized its exclusivity, stating that he had acquired it through a personal connection. He assured my father that it would provide a remarkable tasting experience. At first glance, it was apparent that these were just ordinary local wines. Nearby, my brother-in-law's gift stood out, an exquisite vintage wine worth several thousand dollars. The stark contrast between the gifts filled me with anger, and I couldn't contain my frustration as I confronted my husband. 
I questioned his thoughtlessness, pointing out that he had gifted my father a Mercedes-Benz for his birthday but had only brought two low-quality bottles of wine from a local winery. I challenged him, asking if these were the grand gifts he had boasted about. My husband attempted to defend himself by explaining that he had spent over a month searching for these particular bottles of wine. He also claimed that he had brought the Mercedes-Benz to protect my father, as he feared he might drive it after consuming alcohol. In his eyes, the rare wine was a more thoughtful choice than a car. I couldn't fathom his logic. I questioned his actions, highlighting the absurdity of his so-called thoughtfulness. I couldn't help but express my frustration, pointing out that he had used our savings intended for our future child to purchase the Mercedes-Benz for my father without consulting me. I accused him of hypocrisy, claiming to be logical and rational while making such selfish decisions. In my view, his behavior was far from logical and showcased a beggar's mentality, masked by flimsy excuses. I was thoroughly disappointed in him. Excuse me, but how can you make such a statement? Whom are you referring to as a beggar? If you want to make such claims, perhaps you should have contributed something before passing judgment. To be honest, what has your family ever done for me? Have they established a hospital or a law firm in my name? All they did was provide some money for the down payment on our house, so it's rather audacious to boast about it. And Dad, I must also address this with you. You've amassed considerable wealth, and you can't take it with you when you pass away. So why not consider using some of it to support your son-in-law? Do you realize the substantial inheritance tax I'd have to pay if you left us a large sum? Instead of that, wouldn't it be more practical for you to invest in an apartment building during your lifetime? That would make more sense, don't you think? Why are you making me say all this? While we're on the subject, if you could establish a hospital for your other son-in-law, you would have done plenty. So why not consider letting me take the reins of your company? I have a reputation for being a capable businessman at my job. Given my experience, wouldn't I be more adept at running the company? I implore you to think logically about this situation. Just then, as my mother was washing dishes in the sink, she grabbed a damp towel and tossed it at my husband's face, exclaiming, what nerve you have. Is this the right attitude? You only brought two inexpensive bottles of wine to your father-in-law's 60th birthday celebration, and yet you demand ownership of the company. You are nothing short of a thief without a weapon. I can't help but blame myself for allowing you to marry our beloved daughter. Mother, how could you toss that damp, dirty towel at me? And what about the wine? I had considered our father's feelings and prepared a gift, but isn't your behavior thoughtless? Then my father, his face reddening, retorted, who's being thoughtless here? It was you who acted thoughtlessly when you brought that subpar, cheap wine, claiming that I might drink and drive so that you could buy a car for me. Why didn't you just bring a coffin so I could drink that wretched wine and meet my demise? Wouldn't that have been more rational? Don't attempt to deceive us with your smooth talking. I can't fathom the extent to which you've tormented our daughter with your slick words. Let's approach this rationally. Get a divorce immediately. Additionally, repay the money I lent you for the house. The funds you spent on that Mercedes-Benz include our daughter's hard-earned money, so it's only fair to reimburse it. Furthermore, contribute half of the wedding expenses and transfer it to my account. How does that sound? Isn't it reasonable? I never want to lay eyes on you again, so leave my house this instant. My father forcibly ejected my husband from the house, and soon after, we finalized our divorce. I'll apologize to your father, let's call off our divorce. Think pragmatically. If we divorce and remarry, we'd have to go through another wedding and incur additional expenses. It would be such a waste of money. Let's approach this logically, shall we? He attempted to convince me and hold on to our relationship by emphasizing practicality, but in the end, he had to sign the divorce papers. He met with the lawyer my dad had recommended, and that meeting seemed to have a profound impact on him. 
His unauthorized access to our community savings account to purchase a new car for his father was the breaking point that led to our decision to pursue a divorce. Furthermore, he understood that if our case went to court, he would likely be responsible for paying alimony, which compelled him to accept the divorce. He wasn't a person driven by reason or logic, instead, he came across as self-centered and concerned solely with his own financial interests. It took approximately six months to resolve the financial aspects of our divorce. The process of selling our house also took some time. Now, I find myself living back at my parents' home. I had wanted to find my own place to alleviate the burden on my parents, but my father insisted on taking care of me and welcomed me back. He expressed that he was growing older and felt a sense of loneliness living alone. Meanwhile, I heard rumors that my ex-husband had been actively seeking blind dates in hopes of remarrying swiftly, all because he felt an urgency to have a child. The irony in this situation was rather amusing. He specified that his potential partner should not be an ESTJ, citing his past marriage as the reason. However, he seemed oblivious to the fact that it wasn't about personality types, it was about his own selfishness and narrow-mindedness. I wonder when he'll mature and develop a sense of principles. He appears to believe only what suits his desires and sees only what he wants to see, often overlooking what truly